I had known OM before it was. It has, um, mm -hmm. When I was pastor at Moody Church, George was a student at MBI. We got to know each other very well. He used to come around and chat with me and I with him and we with the Lord together. We became very close. We had several all nights of prayer at that time at Moody Church. He came to all of them. I don't know whether he got permission to do that, but he came anyway. <laughs> and uh, his presence at a prayer meeting, as you know, is apt to start the fire burning. And certainly, though geographically we've been separated, spiritually we're very close. And very thankful to have the opportunity of ministry to a small group. Um, it isn't the size of a meeting that makes a meeting, it's the sense of God's presence and um, the Lord working with his people and um, I'm very thankful for this uh, privilege of sharing with you I live in Birmingham now nothing very attractive about it two and a half million people live there <clears throat> of whom one third are Muslim mm -hmm. and growing rapidly I tremble to think what this country would, might be like in ten years' time, certainly not English, and um, heading, I think, for disaster unless a miracle takes place mm -hmm. and the Lord gives us spiritual revival. I suppose 1984 would have seen the largest number of people hear the gospel in this country than ever before in history at Mission England and Louis Palau and so on. That was tremendous. I think about 90,000 people were one for Jesus. That was great. The follow-through on churches, certainly in Birmingham, has not been too good. And um, I would just like to read an extract here from Finney, who says, Evangelism is one thing, revival is another. Evangelism is the constant duty of the church. <clears throat> revival is a conviction of the spirit at work in a church. It is possible to have very successful evangelistic meetings without ever touching revival. The greatest evangelistic campaign leaves a city untouched, while revival sweeps the community. Revival is the renewal of the first love of Christians something resulting in the conversion of sinners to God. It presupposes that the church is backslidden, and revival means conviction of sin and searching of heart among God's people. Revival is nothing less than a new beginning of obedience to God, a breaking of heart, and a getting down into the dust before him with deep humility and forsaking of sin. Revival breaks the power of the world and of sin over Christians. The charm of the world is broken and the power of sin is overcome. Truths to which our hearts are unresponsive suddenly become alive. Whereas mind and conscience may assent to truth, when revival comes, obedience to the truth is the one thing that matters. That last sentence really penetrates, especially... Mind and conscience may assent to truth, but when revival comes, obedience to the truth is the one thing that matters. I think that it's not the primary thing that we should know more truth. The primary thing is that we should give 100% obedience to what we already know. Because the clarion call of the New Testament church was, we must obey God. And that guaranteed the Holy Spirit getting into business. So this is a very personal matter, and this has been the burden I have felt I ought to try and share with you in some way, because I was told I would be speaking to a company of people who were not sort of first-termers with OM. You've known something of the toughness and uh, the testing, and uh, all that's involved in life where the action is, in the front line of the battle. And... Um, it's such a privilege to speak with you because this is um, essentially a personal thing. It has been said that the worthwhileness of any movement 
lies its inability, in its ability to mobilize its entire membership to propagate what it believes. If you think that through, that's really New Testament living and witness to Christ. And that's where there's a tremendous breakdown today. Um, was it in Christianity today? I saw some time ago, I think it was. Um, in the average church role in Britain and America, of the total membership, 5% don't exist. 10% can't be found. 25% never attend church. 50% have no mission interest. 75% never attend midweek service or prayer meeting. 90% um, never win anybody to Christ. If that's true, which I suspect it is, it's a shattering condemnation of the complete breakdown of New Testament church growth and New Testament individual growth of Christian people. And that's our burden to share these days because I'm sure the answer to it is the release of the Holy Spirit in his grace and in his gifts that everyone is using the gift that God has given them. Not the gift that somebody else has, but the gift that God has given you. So these are the things that burden me and concern me. And I would like you, if you will, uh, to open your Bible this morning and to read with me a portion. <clears throat> I hope I'm talking loud enough. I don't know, but I could talk lo louder. I'm afraid that I might blast you out of the room if I get excited. So I won't do that. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 5. Let me, there was a time when you could uh, have the whole congregation read together. <laughs> it was marvelous. <laughs> but now it's chaotic. I think everybody was speaking in tongues, and that would never do, of course. But um, today I'm using the AV. Ten years ago in this country, the RSV, was the edition that everybody used. Now everybody's fallen hook, line and sinker for the NIV. Okay? That's the nearly indispensable version. <laughs> or, <laughs> I would rather be inclined to call it the not infallible version. <coughs> so, at the moment, I'm sticking with a King James. Uh, I'm not apologizing for so doing. Chapter 5, I think, reading from verse 10. <coughs> For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Therefore, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest to God, and our trust also made manifest in your own consciences. For we commend not ourselves again to you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf that you may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we beside, be beside ourselves, it is to God. Whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live to themselves, but unto him which died for them, and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, <coughs> yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no, so no more. Therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away, behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, 
and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you, in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Could we just have a word of prayer together? Just a moment quiet. There's a chorus I'd like to all to sing. I don't know if you knew it. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch him, and say that we love him. You know that one? Could you strike up the right tune to it for us? Open eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch him, and say that Lord, answer prayer. It would be a futile few days if we did not see him and touch him by faith and move forward and onward and downward deeper into the will of God for each one of our lives. Have your own way. Thou the potter, we are the clay. Hold us, make us after your will while we are waiting, yielded and still. Amen. I think um, verse 17 of this chapter is about um, well, the most dynamic definition of a Christian to be found anywhere in the New Testament. i read it again to you. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The RSV and the NIV, more or less the same, they put it this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. So if uh, anyone, that is not only a few people who decide to live according to one standard and others to another, but if anyone, if anyone in whose life is in Christ, in whose life the great miracle of the new birth has taken place and they've been born again, and like the branch is in the vine and the life of the vine is in the branch is a new creation new that is not in the sense you get a new coat to replace an old one but new a different kind of person altogether the living bible paraphrase I think puts it very strongly when anyone becomes a Christian he becomes a brand new person inside not the same anymore a new life has begun. In other words, uh, at our new new birth, some we because of that we are governed by new principles, move in different directions with new motives and so on. And uh, not just we've added a few new things to the old ones, not just to change a few practices, but completely different kind of people. In other words, um, the Holy Spirit has come to indwell us, not to produce a few super deluxe Christians per generation and leave all the rest of us third class. He's come to enable us, when he says, to live a normal Christian life. And that's a tremendous challenge to me. 
And uh, it makes me ask myself a question in his name to all of us. What kind of people are we? What sort of person am I? How would we line up with that description of a Christian? You notice that that verse begins with the word therefore. Well, you have that word, of course, you find out what it's there for. And uh, in defining the terms of what a Christian is, Paul comes to the conclusion that there are certain evidences, clearly, in his life, which uh, characteristics which give him away. Things he doesn't have to argue for. Verse 11, What we are is known to God, and I trust also to your own consciences. In other words, some things about us that are so self-evident that they give us away. And uh, we're not boasting, but we're asking you to see in our lives something that's um, founded on reality, not merely outward appearances. At Pentecost, it always strikes me, two, the crowd asked two questions. One was, uh, what's all this mean? The other was, what, what are we to do about it? That must have made evangelism very easy. <laughs> when the crowd start asking questions, what does this mean? And something should be apparent in your life and mine which gives us away as belonging to the Lord. How we are at, how we behave in certain sexes, which is totally different, and they don't understand it. They have to ask how, and uh, the answer is, of course, what are we to do? And the answer to that word is repent and believe. And so Paul says, um, there are these characteristics and evidences, and um, why are they there? How is it possible? Well, he says in verse uh, 14, there's a father in my heart which didn't exist previously. Verse 14, the love of Christ constrains us. The love of Christ, not my love for Jesus, but the love of Christ in me. I find it very hard to say in human language, ordinary language, what that means. The love of Christ, it was long before the foundation of the world, it had no beginning, no ending. Jesus had nothing to gain from that stoop, from the throne to a manger. He made himself nothing. You know, he went on loving, though those to whom he came didn't love him and didn't respond at all. Yet, one day the love of Jesus took him to Calvary and the sword of God's justice buried itself in his heart as he went to the cross for us through all the spitting and the shame and everything. And uh, the love of Christ, the last verse, sums it up in wonderful language. Again, I quote from Living Letters. God took the sinless Jesus and poured into him all our sin and in exchange he poured all God's goodness into us. You can't really, as you think that through, get to the bottom of it. I must just say it again. It's so breathtaking, really. God took the sinless Christ and poured into him all our sin. And in exchange, he poured all God's goodness into us. In other words, the life of a Christian is an exchange life. Exchange life. Not trying to be better. Trying to be good trying to make myself more holy is Jesus. The only good thing about any of us is Jesus. Mm. A life of complete exchange. The love of Christ constrained. Now that word constrain, it's a bit difficult to translate into English because it has many sort of meaning, meanings. Um, the RSV says the love of Christ con controls us. The NIV, the love of Christ compels us. <clears throat> if you use the illustration of a horse that uh, is held back by a rein the rein keeps it in check directs it into which road it should go along the right path around the right bend and Paul says the love of Christ has so got hold of me 
that that love keeps me from doing something of which I'd be utterly ashamed. I can't do it now, not because I try to stop myself doing it, not because I fight with temptation and that, but I can't do it because of the love of Jesus. It would bring disgrace upon him. I sometimes use commentaries still. I've got a bit tired of some of them. The comment on everything except the thing I'm looking for. But the commentary of um, Jamison, Fawcett, and Brown is good on this verse. It says this There is an irresistible object which so controls the life of a Christian that he lives with one objective in view to the elimination of any other possible consideration. You know, that needs thinking about. Just let me read it again. An irresistible object which has so controlled the life of a Christian that he lives with one objective in view to the elimination of any other possible consideration. Just like a river that's in flood is dammed up and restrained and um, put into one channel and, uh, and its power increases in flow and everything until it bursts into the ocean. The love of Christ grips me like this, controls me. And so if any man be in Christ, he's a totally different kind of person. The world says he's a fanatic, a fool. Now you may be saying to me, some of you, I don't know, but you might, that's going too far because um, the Christian, it's faith that saves him. Well, but faith is... Um, held by love and works by love and unless my faith in Jesus is gripped in some measure grips me by a love like that it isn't saving faith I'm safe in quoting C.H. Spurgeon here see, where he says um, unless your faith radically alters your behaviour it will never change your destiny that's pretty shattering we don't often hear that preached these days. Unless your faith radically changes your behavior, it will never change your destiny. The love of Christ does that, says Paul. That's the fervor that's revealed in his life. <clears throat> and, of course, it's true, obviously, isn't it, that whether people are good or bad, it's men that are controlled by one principle that make an impact, either for good or ill. People who are under the control of one for a few minutes and others for another, like the jet stream that comes out of a plane, they don't count for anything. They don't last for anything at all. But a uh, man who's controlled by one principle, that's why you've got um, the Caesars and Napoleons, Mussolinis, Hitlers, Khrushchevs, and all the rest of them, bad men. That's also why you have Whitfields, Dale Moody's, C.T. Studs, Hudson Taylor's, and if I may be so tactless as to go to the present generation, that's why you have George Thurber's, Billy Graham's. But more than that, I never forget one of my early trips abroad was to Ethiopia. And I went there to visit one of our missionaries. There she was. She was 70 years of age at the time. And uh, had a little mud cottage in a very isolated place. And she was translating the Bible into two different languages. She'd been at the job for years and years. It was nearly completed. And I said to her, when, when are you getting your next burlo? And she just looked at me and she said, in heaven. That kind of person will never get a write-up in Buzz magazine. <coughs> never be heard of in, in uh, family or in any of them. But I tell you, there will be some remarkable reverses of form when we get to glory. People have never been heard of. The love of Christ constraints. That's it. Hmm. And poor, poor that looked with... In, the Holy Spirit is and looked into the heart of God and the love of Jesus 
gripped him and compelled him to the exclusion of any possible att attraction. Some people might say, now that must be awful bondage for a Christian. I mean, it means you never have a day off. No, you don't. From Christian living. But it wasn't bondage. That was freedom. Slavery to Jesus is perfect freedom. And uh, it's uh, God who works in us to will and to do his good pleasure. It's the Spirit of God in us who makes us want and long for that in our lives. And so he's governed by that principle seven days a week. There's no room for anything else. No arrivals. But um, how did that happen? It wasn't merely <coughs> a sort of emotional thing. It wasn't that. It was based upon facts. Two tremendous facts in the Christian faith which radically change our lives. One I'm sure we're all happy about the fact of substitution the substitutionary death of Jesus for us all the other identification with him I'm not so sure uh, whether we all do understand and rejoice in that bearing shame and scoffing root in my place condemned he stood sealed my pardon with his blood hallelujah he's my saviour Isaiah 53 he was wounded for our transgressions bruised for our iniquities the chastisement which procured our peace was laid upon him the great fact of the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ is the thing which starts the fire burning in our heart kindles the flame and as we accept it day by day we have perfect peace with God but that's not the only fact there's this one he, if he died for all says Paul here then the all are dead and here Paul is seeing, I see in the cross something else. That just as by my first birth I was involved in condemnation, guilt, sin and judgment, I wasn't responsible for that. But inevitably I was involved in it. So by my second birth I was involved in something else I wasn't responsible for. Because... Um, I received a new life in my heart which had already been through death and had risen again from the tomb and ascended to heaven and that life received from the Lord adequate resources in the Holy Spirit the right for me to live in him and so when Jesus died well I was died, died there too and was buried with him and rose and ascended to heaven and while my feet are on the ground my heart's in heaven and I have within me an old life which is absolutely hopeless and will never be any good and has never changed till my dying day I also have a new life a new life which has died and risen, ascended and I have that life living in me right now and Paul realized that therefore <laughs> oh and get too excited about this it's tremendous to know isn't it that uh, Jesus is exactly the opposite to all that I am precisely so I don't spend five minutes a day trying to make myself better because if you do that you're on a sticky wicket you're on a losing wicket trying to improve, improve myself there's no sin on earth which I'm not capable of committing two minutes if I get out of here but for the grace of God that's the only good thing about me therefore why spend two moments trying to make, improve myself when the Lord isn't in that business at all he doesn't improve me he gives his life instead of me that he might live through me in his power if you're unholy he's holy if you're impatient he's patient if you're lacking in love he's love whatever you are he's the opposite so don't try and improve yourself but take the opposite every moment of every day just taking Jesus to be in you which you can't do yourself doing the thing that I know I can't do in the power that he gives me to do it when I'm willing when I'm really wanting and longing him for his victory and his power oh yes um, I'm no different from that day when I was converted potentially a lot worse but oh it's wonderful in Jesus to be free 
Let me illustrate a bit of them. Do you, do you like uh, do you like flying? I don't. I used to like when to, to go over to the States by ship, take four days off, and no jet lag, and perfect peace and quietness. I loved it. Now I, you can't do that, and uh, I don't like it very much. I've had too many incidents, not accidents, but incidents, and one of them I shall never forget. It stays with me. I was flying at the time from um, Johannesburg to London, British Airways, forgive the commercial, and uh, I got into this plane about 10 o'clock at night, and it was packed, absolutely packed, and uh, I got into it, I thought to myself, Lord, this weighs about a million and a half pounds, for you know, it is an awful lot to take off the ground, and I sat on the one empty seat I could find, it was not allotted to me, and next to me was a... Um, a steward, one of the crew, and um, I thought I'd be chatty with him, unusual for an Englishman. And so I said, uh, "Do you like flying these planes?" And he said, "Not much, sir." Oh, I said, "Why?" Oh, he said, "They're too often going wrong." Oh, <laughs> yeah, yes, he said, um, "This one has been taken out of service three times in two weeks because of engine failure. It was put right yesterday, and we believe it's okay now." <laughs> oh. So I looked at the cap back of the captain's head away and I said Lord bless him tonight <laughs> and uh, we went along to the runway you know usual formalities so. and then the engines began to roar and off we went but then you know exactly the sort of person I am um, I have a little stopwatch thing and I know that a Boeing 747 <coughs> fully loaded 430 <coughs> passengers or something with gas and everything takes 46 seconds to get off the ground it may take a second or two more with uh, wind speed and so on but we went off I watched my watch going round and at 35 seconds it suddenly slowed down and there was a strange silence throughout the plane no talking and I followed my watch 40 seconds 46 oh long way short of required speed for takeoff 150 knots 50 seconds 55 seconds Oh, Lord, how long is this runway? <laughs> and we went on and on and on, and at 62 seconds it made it, and whoop! Just at the moment where the white line marking the end of the runway went underneath the plane, and it went up and up, and the engines were vibrating like nothing of nobody's business. The whole plane shook as those engines just shook with it. And everybody was very quiet half an hour went by still fastening your seat safety belt still on no smoking so also that didn't bother me but the sign remained on and we went on and on and in about 40 minutes the captain came onto the intercom <coughs> he had a very Oxford accent and he said good evening ladies and gentlemen I am sorry I've had no time to uh, speak with you I have some rather sad news. I've lost an engine. Oh. <laughs> I don't know how you'd react to that, but <laughs> I reacted stupidly in my mind. I said, you didn't worry about that, old boy. I'd gladly jump out and get it for you. But <laughs> I knew that wasn't what he meant. He'd lost the power of the engine. An engine had cut on And he said, um, our next stop is Nairobi. But with three engines and a full load, I don't think we'll make it. So, with your permission, how unnecessary. With your, <laughs> with your permission, we'll turn round and we'll land at Joburg again, and you'll be put on another flight. Well, obviously, or else I wouldn't be here. We were. <laughs> but I've never forgotten that because, well, one reason, it's such a tremendous illustration of the meaning of the gospel. You see, <coughs> that was plane was going along a runway. And it was bound, held in the grip of the law of gravity, holding it down. At 35 seconds, an engine cut. Three engines are put on emergency power. And the end, the whole plane vibrates as it went on harder and harder and harder. 62 seconds, he made it. And he... Yeah, I was going to say... He, well, what he did was tilted the nose of the plane up into the air. 
and uh, pulls a stick and turns his nose up to the air. And then in a minute, in a second, it's grabbed by another law, the law of aerodynamics, which takes over from the law of gravity and carries it up and up and up and up till it gets to 30,000 feet. Oh, there's no condemnation of those who live in Christ Jesus. For whereas once we were bound by the law of sin, now another law has taken law over the law of the Spirit of life in Christ. Do you know something of the lift of the Holy Spirit? That lifts you up above all the downward drag of self and lifts you up into the life of Jesus. Something sometimes there may be quite a bit of vibration. Sometimes some uh, some shocks, but he holds you in his grip. Oh, that makes the Christian life something exciting. It really does. It's not really emotion, therefore. A Christian is held. He's reconciled to God by the blood and saved by the life of Jesus. Romans 5.10 I'm sure that all of us know what it is to be reconciled by his blood. I'm not so sure that we've all learned what it is to be saved by his life. Two empty hands stretched out to God. That's a Christian life. On the one, I receive forgiveness on the ground of his death. On the other, I receive life by his Holy Spirit. I stretch out the one hand or else I wouldn't be saved at all. What have I done with the second? Filled it up with Christian work? Filled it up with activity? <laughs> filled it up with business? I haven't time to stop. So rushed, so pressed. Get my priorities all wrong? The family gets neglected? Huh. Who was the dear man who came from me for me yesterday? Andrew, was it? Oh. Was it? Where is he? Oh, he's dear now. He's had enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a dear chat. What a chat we had. And, you know, he's asking me questions and so on. And he said to me, what's been the biggest battle in your Christian life? And uh, to learn, I said, to learn that I must never undertake more work for the Lord than I can cover in believing prayer. If I do that, I'm out on my own. How well I remember in Chicago days. We lived at first for the first five years there, out in the suburbs. Some of you who know that area, Lincoln Woods, Skokie Way, about 10 miles from Muddy Church. <clears throat> I left home every morning at seven. I never, well, I would better hesitate on that one. Very rarely, more, not more than ooh, once in a couple of months, did I get home before ten at night. We had 31 committees at Moody Church. Help. And I was chairman of them all. <laughs> How stupid. And uh, morning, noon, and night. Work, work, work. Seven days a week. On the occasions when I did come home, about once in two months, what did I see as I came up the road? Two little girls looking. And uh, <coughs> they'd come out to me and say, Denny, are you going out to another meeting tonight? And I was ashamed to say yes. Our marriage suffered from that. Oh, never been anything wrong in it, but uh, my wife and I weren't close enough. Watch it. Watch it. When I left business as a CA, one of the chief arguments I put in favour of going into the ministry was much more time to read my Bible and pray. I would never put that now. I've never had one day in 50 years in which I've had time to read my Bible and pray. I've had to make it. And in making it, I had to drop something that seemed absolutely important. But nothing, as any substitute ever can be, for the time spent alone with God. If you excuse me again, I'll be through shortly. Chicago days taught me a lot. I learned so much from A.W. Tozer. <clears throat> Thank you for the mention you made, by the way, of my books. I haven't read any of them myself. <laughs> but uh, I've preached them. But I, I've devoured A.W. Tozer's. And I recommend that to you. In Pursuit of God. A tremendous book of Tozer. But I knew him well. He was a great privilege. 
because soon after I arrived there, he called me and said, you probably have a pretty difficult time in Moody Church, it's rather dispensational, etc. But if you'd like time in prayer, I'd love to have prayer with him. So I said, oh my, I would love it. But when? And where? Well, he said, I go every day between April and October to the south shore of Lake Michigan at uh, five o'clock in the morning. And I stay there late. So if you can join me at that time, I'd love to. Well, I mean, it was 15 miles away from where I lived and it was very early. <laughs> I didn't go too often. Perhaps I made an excuse and said, well, it's really holy ground. But you know, whenever I got there, there was A.W. Tozer, flat on his face on the sands with an open Bible, talking to the Lord. Three hours. I shall never forget those tremendous times with him. A real man of God. I used to hear him preach, preach sometimes at MBI and phew, didn't bless it. And did I ever hear a man speak with such authority? Very rarely. Just, he was clothed with Holy Spirit power. I knew why. Because he gave the best hours of the day to God. I wish I could live it again. But I would say there's no substitute for that. And when you put Christian work before it. Well, sometime, sometime read First Chronicles chapter 4. Don't bother to look up now. I think in verse 23 it says there were certain members of the tribe of Judah who lived among ditches and hedges. Not much glamour in that. And there they dwelt with the king for his work. And the thing that flashed into my mind was do I dwell with the work with the work for the king or do I dwell with the king for the work it's all the difference if I dwell with the work for the king I'm shut up to my own limitations if I dwell with the king for the work I'm receiving day by day his sufficiency his strength his adequacy so I would beg of you most of all to keep your priorities right forgive me for all that let me say to you in conclusion though I am very comforted to remind myself that Paul said finally brethren in writing to the Philippian church when he was only halfway through and began the third chapter finally brethren he said it again in chapter 4 verse 7 so <laughs> just indication he was getting his second witness but, but just uh, <laughs> in conclusion <laughs> there's a fellowship and not only this, this tremendous fervor and these facts that, um, that uh, are basic, but a fellowship that is recognized by Paul in daily life. Read 15 and 16. He died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, henceforth now know we him no more. The RSV, I think, puts it very clearly. We regard no one from a human point of view. Now there's, uh, if you notice the significance there of those verses, there's a fellowship that is recognized in that life of man who's a new creation, and a, a fellowship that's horizontal, and a fellowship that's vertical with heaven. Now, I've got to be careful here. Because, you see, the love of Jesus for us is answered from our hearts, in our hearts, by the love of Christ burning like a fire through me. Not my love for him, but the Holy Spirit has come in me to reproduce the life of heaven. And that means fellowship with the Spirit and with the Father in my heart his love burning in me the love of Christ shed abroad brings a response love knows no limit to its endurance no end to its trust no end to its fading <coughs> its hope it can outlast anything it is one fact one thing that still stands when everything else has fallen that's First Corinthians 13 so in the life that is born again I want to get this in my own heart because it's so wonderful 
there's a reaction and a response because the Holy Spirit in me responds to the love of God for me. F.W. Faber writes a lovely hymn. I don't know if you've ever heard it. It says this. O Jesus, Jesus, dearest Lord, forgive me if I say, for very love thy sacred name a thousand times a day. I love thee so, I know not how my transport to control. Thy love is like a burning fire within my very soul. Burn, burn, O love, within my heart. Burn fiercely night and day, till all the dross of earthly care is burned and burned away. O Jesus, Jesus, sweetest Lord, who art thou not to me? Each hour brings joy before unknown, each day new liberty. Is there in my heart a fellowship like that? Love has answered love. Deep has called to deep. In a life which is barren, cold and dead, the Holy Spirit has kindled a flame. It's not that my old nature is loving God, because it can't. If you say to me, my heart is in love, and there's warmth in it, and I really love Jesus, just be careful you don't get spiritually proud, because you can't do that. What you're doing is letting the Holy Spirit free, letting him loose, letting him love the Father in your heart. <laughs> My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine, for thee all the follies of sin I design. That's a heavenly fellowship in your heart today. It's the strength of all your Christian living. But um, this fellowship should be revealed earthward too. From now on, we regard no one from the human point of view, my word, if the church today could only get hold of this. The things that used to mark our friendships and our fellowship, our likes and dislikes for people, our barriers, our forbidden areas, distinction of color, distinction of race, distinction of nationality. <coughs> Henceforth, I no regard no one from the human point of view, Paul says. And to strengthen that old argument, is, is, you notice, he uses <coughs> an example in the life of Christ. There was a day, he says, when our wonderful Lord, referring to his crucifixion, looked into the faces of his disciples and said, it is better for you that I go away. I can imagine him saying, Lord, that takes some believing. We talked with you, walked with you, been to your college for three years. How can that be? If I do not depart, the Comforter, the Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And in that day you shall know that I am in my Father, you are in me, and I in you. Therefore we know not Christ after the flesh. Not again, not again like that. But we know him far greater, far richer, in a far deeper fellowship than ever. And therefore I am not going to love people because uh, one is white, another is black. Because somebody's nice or somebody's not so nice. No. Because this love of Jesus has brought to the ground that kind of fellowship. Not only nice people. Do you ever ask the Lord, Lord, make me humble, but please you somebody somebody nice to do it? <laughs> You'll find he doesn't. <laughs> somebody you don't like. <clears throat> Holy Church uh, every Sunday morning at one time five minutes to eleven a man one of our trustees poked his head through the door of the study where I was waiting for the service and looked at me and said hopeless pastor church half empty again today shut it shut the door well that didn't help <laughs> as you know the church well you don't know seated four thousand people two thousand wasn't a bad crowd but uh, 2,000 2, empty seats to look at every day and 2,000 little devils hopped out of them and said, you're no use. So didn't need that chap to come and tell me. And then two minutes later, another one came. He was an elder. And he came right across the floor and put his arm around my shoulder and said, Pastor, wonderful. Church is half full today. Which was it easier for me to love? I don't need to answer the question, do I? <laughs> My reaction to man number one was exactly the opposite to everything I preached in the pulpit. 
<laughs> and so I said, I'm going to get rid of that film. I wrote him a letter. And it really burned up. Get out of here to some other fundamental church in Chicago. Go and do your thing there. You know, use here. We can never have blessing with men like you, etc., etc. And I left that letter on my desk. And uh, my wife saw it. Now you know exactly, don't you, that... Um, Every good wife knows exactly what her husband is thinking. And she said this, she saw that letter. She said, don't you think we'd better have some prayer together before you send that letter? Oh, I said, rather, I'd love it. Do, let's, let's have it. I've prayed a lot about it, of course. But uh, <laughs> then it is, and let's pray. But uh, you pray, will you? So she and I went out down and prayed together. <laughs> I've never forgotten the next 15 minutes when she prayed not for the man but for her husband and something happened in the church that day it happened in the pulpit the Lord had broken my heart I never forgotten since that day that the chorus which we sing so glibly spirit of the living God fall afresh on me the first request it makes is break me melt me mold me and fill me and that's a costly thing that letter was never sent but I tell you we had a breath of Holy Spirit revival I hardly needed to preach for a Sunday or two George Verbo would tell you remind you of this so he didn't know the detail <laughs> I didn't have to make an invitation for people to come forward they just came and knelt down broken and God had broken through Christian fellowship never reaches higher ground or deeper ground than its leadership. Therefore, what a responsibility we all have. And that leads me, in conclusion, just to ask again a question that I ask myself, what sort of people are we? I think this country, speaking for Britain, is in grave peril unless there is a revival of New Testament Christian living and in many, many areas I think we've got to stop playing church and really get out where the action is and uh, in the name of Jesus take up the attack because today I don't want to be critical uh, you know Christians can do almost anything you can jump around and shout and dance and all that that's fine, I'd probably do the same myself, but took half a minute of that would send it to heaven. And so <laughs> I, I don't do it, but I'm, I'm thankful for the enthusiasm that's uh, revealed in those who do. Wonderful. But when John saw Jesus on the island of Patmos, I saw him. And his face was shining in, as the sun in unclouded brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And that's the effect of seeing Jesus. A brokenness, a death. No longer living to ourselves, but to him. Hmm. You may read the magazine of the OMF. Some time ago there was an article in it by um, Leslie Lyle telling of it, uh, the work in China under the CIM, China Mission, in 1950 onwards, telling how the uh, breakthrough of communism came with a uh, promise of self-government, self-propagation and uh, self-support for the church, and um, together with complete religious freedom. Well, for a while it worked, but not for long. And they soon discovered that that meant total allegiance to the communist regime. And Les Lyle says that for the next ten years, if there was a Christian in China who was true to the word, he was either killed or put in prison or banished to some climate that would kill him before long. And in that little group of people who were brainwashed until they were nearly, nearly mad, there were those who trusted the Lord. And when they met each other in the street, they used to say, goodbye, see you inside next time that meant in prison and one girl who was arrested the story I told in the book that when they came to put the 
handcuffs on her. She held out her arms with her wrists held together and said, Lord, I'm not worthy. The love of Christ constrained her. Of course, you know the difference now. I mean, whole tribes coming to Jesus. Great measure of millions who've turned to Christ. But that revival kind of meet thing, that kind of event doesn't happen without a crucifixion. And in the busy church in Britain, I just pray God that we won't miss it. Because I question whether we'll have another chance. I think, oh yes, the end must come. I was reading only this morning again, and I haven't, I haven't really chewed it over. But i uh, let you chew it over with me. Because the chapter finishes when we are then we're ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God that's a tremendous word. I mean when two people have a quarrel or two groups have a quarrel who's responsible for putting it right surely the person is responsible for causing it but not here for this chapter leaves me seeing Jesus as though God did beseech you by us it's Jesus on his knees before a rebel humanity we pray you in Christ's stead be you reconciled to God that's how I ought to preach and that's how we ought to too knowing it is Jesus in us begging people to be reconciled to God the love of Christ constrains us let's pray <coughs> Jesus, <clears throat> Jesus, thine all victorious love is shed in my heart abroad. And my heart shall no longer rove rooted and fixed in God. Oh, that in me the sacred fire might now begin to blow, to burn. Burn up the drafts of base desire and make the mountains flow. O oh, thou who at Pentecost this fall, do thou mine. Let my, my spirit come. We want all that you have for us, Lord. And therefore we would just now, in our hearts, hold out our hands and say, Lord, put the handcuffs on. May we be thy slaves, happy slaves, because in there is perfect freedom. Thank you, Lord. We praise you for all that you're waiting to do through a life that's totally obedient. Have your way. For your name's sake. <clears throat>